is the incredibly rare 1980 Jalira twin cylinder 1252 stroke dirt bike. It's a truly mythical machine, but as you might have seen from the title of this video, it was totally banned from racing by both the FIM and the AMA. But it doesn't seem completely clear to me why that was. So in this video today, we're gonna to try and find out why this thing was outlawed from racing. I'll also tell you how we managed to track down this bonkers bike. We'll go through some of the features that make it so special and maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to take it for a spin. Okay, so it's dark, it's cold and it's way too early. We've just arrived at the airport. So why are we here? Well, we're on the search for another super rare bike. A unicorn, if you will. You've seen us search for these things on the channel before. We absolutely love it. We found the 1000cc hill climb bike. We've had the RC500s in the past. As they were looking for a new one. I absolutely love it. It gives me such a buzz finding these things. And I think you guys really enjoy it as well. So with the help of my friend, Dave King, Mr. VMXDN, the unicorn hunter of your wheel. He's super, super good at finding these amazing, rare, one of a kind bikes. And he's found another one for us today for this video. So we would travel anywhere to find these super rare, super exotic unicorn bikes. We're at the airport now and we're heading to Italy, the home of Gilera. Now, who are Gilera? What are Gilera? Here's a little history lesson. Gilera was founded in 1909 by Mr. Giuseppe Gilera near Milan in northern Italy. Mr. Gilera was a former apprentice of the Bianchi Bicycle Company and he was also a keen amateur motorcycle racer competing in local hill climbs and circuit races. At the end of the first decade of the 20th century, his passion became his business and the first machine to carry his name was the Gilera VT317. Over the next few decades, Gilera became famous for producing motorcycles with unique and interesting engines like the Quattro Bologna and the Otto Bologna. These unique Gilera machines were winning European championships and posting top speed records, setting them up to take over the racing world once the dust from World War II had settled. With the introduction of the Saturno 500, Gilera absolutely dominated the early years of the 500cc road racing world championship, which is obviously the forerunner to today's MotoGP. Gilera won that championship six times in eight years, with Britain's own Jeff Duke being their most successful racer. They were truly on top of the world. But in 1957, things changed suddenly. After the death of his 26-year-old son due to hepatitis, it's reported that Mr. Gilera fell out of love with racing. This also coincided with a downturn in bike sales after the war as cars became more popular. As a result of this downturn and in an effort to save costs, I've also read that the tragedy of Guizzolo played its part in souring the taste of racing in Italy. A gentleman's agreement was made between all of the Italian motorcycle manufacturers to withdraw from and abandon world championship competition. I did not know that that happened and I found it to be an extraordinary fact for motorcycle history. Can you imagine that today, like KTM just withdrawing from MXGP after a decade of dominance? You just can't picture it happening, can you? Anyway, I guess this change in direction set the course for what was about to come and ultimately led to the creation of the machine that we've come to Italy searching for today. As bike sales continued to decline throughout the 1960s, Gilera found themselves in financial trouble and they were eventually bought out by Piaggio in 1969. So it was Piaggio then that sent Gilera down the dirt bike path. In the 1970s, Gilera would make their return to world championship competition although this time it was on the dirt rather than the tarmac. From the records that I can find, it appears as though Gilera's first season of Grand Prix motocross was in 1977. Gilera earned their motocross stripes over the next few years, 
until they were ready to completely change the game with the earth-shattering 125 by Cylindrica. The two-cylinder, two-carb, rotary valve engine factory machine that shrieked with a whistle fierce enough to strike fear into the hearts of the hardiest racers. And that is the machine that we've travelled all this way to find for this video. Just wait for our baggage to arrive now and while we do that i just want to say take this moment to say a big thank you to our sponsors peace line and 24mx for supporting what we do we couldn't go on trips like this one and make videos like the one you're watching right now without their support so if you can say a big thank you to those guys on social media and if you're interested in any of their products they've got some great products both peace line and 24mx we use them ourselves especially peace line mx9 two stroke oil and all of the 24MX product, products like the, the gear bag, the stands, there's so much stuff they've got. Use our code 999LASER for 15% off on the 24MX website. I'll put links to all of that stuff in the description down below. Without their support, we couldn't do what we do. So as always, a huge thank you to 24MX and Line. Now let's go and find this bike. So we're here in Northern Italy and we've been able to track down this absolute specimen, the Gilera 125 Bicylindrica, that's the twin cylinder two stroke. Dave is the man that's helped us track this down. Now me and Dave, we've got some history of tracking down some really rare and interesting bikes, but this thing truly is a mythical beast, right? You, you... I think, yeah, this is probably the hardest bike to that we've tracked down so far. Yeah. Just talk about how we managed to track this bike down and then the history of this particular machine. Yeah, so a fairly long story really, probably going back for me maybe 15 years. I'd been coming to Italy racing vintage events and going to bike jumbles and I'd already always heard a story that there was a Gilera twin cylinder somewhere mm -hmm. in this region. But totally by fluke, two years ago I was at a race um, at Arco de Trento and lo and behold this bike was there and it was like wow there's yeah. the holy grail tell us about the the history of this particular machine because they only made three of these bikes three to bikes. start with right? absolutely and this is number three and this is the only one in existence gilera do have one apparently in their museum but was built up, up, up out of spare parts so this is as ridden at the grand prix it's signed here by Franco Puffini, right, who was the rider who rode it in those GPs and did pretty well on it. Yep. Um, and by Jan Witteven, yeah. a Dutch guy who was chief engineer at the time. The mastermind. Who, the mastermind behind the whole project, who is now currently the mastermind at Fantic. Fantic. Right? So from what I kind of know is he got in his contract was like he got a bike. And Every machine that he was part of, he got a version of it. Yep, and the history of this bike is this was uh, Jan's bike. He owned it and then sold it to many uh, the guys who like 90s motocross will remember the Pepsi Honda team of the 90s. Yeah, uh, Yves de Maria rode for them. So this then went to uh, the owner of that team, an Italian guy, and now has been with the, the present owner for the last four years who has beautifully He's not restored it, but he's just brought it back to life just as it should be. It's not over restored. It's absolutely perfect. Yeah, I think they're saying pretty much everything's original on it, yeah. maybe apart from the rear fender. Apart from the rear fender, which the rear fender the, the, the owner has got, but it's so valuable and there's a potential today maybe that the bike gets ridden and there's no way that this bike needs throwing down the road no, and plastics no. getting broken. You've raised the bar. Yeah, we, we with have this with this one. And if there's, if there's any bikes out there that anybody any special bikes that anybody wants us to track down, yeah. uh, get in contact with Max or put it in the, uh, the comments and we'll do our best to find it for you. The twin cylinder 125 utilised the exact same chassis as its single cylinder water-cooled cousin, 
which itself was a development of the old air-cooled bike raced in the late 1970s. Just to give you a look at the scale of this bike, a 125cc twin cylinder bike. The, the size of the kickstart, the kickstart really is no bigger than a, a, a gear change on a modern bike. A tiny, tiny little thing, but you just give it a little stab and it fires up. We can see that it uses a double cradle frame and WP twin shocks that were shorter and lighter than the previous generation. And there's the 38 mm forks up front with magnesium sliders from British based brand CCM. Uh, we've got the twin Del Auto carburetors, very, very Italian. Japanese bikes of the day never used Del Auto carbs, but most of the Italian bikes did and worked extremely well. The engine was designed by a genius engineer named Jan Witteven, who is a man that's gone on to do great things in the motorcycle world and is currently a head honcho at Fantic. The motor features two cylinders inclined 50 degrees forward from the vertical axes. The lower cylinder has the front exhaust port and the upper cylinder has the rear port. Coming down to the swinging arm, the swinging arm really reminds me of factory Suzuki from that era. The, the RA125 factory Suzukis were always painted black and this, this really looks very, very similar to, um, to a work Suzuki swinging arm. The gear shifter was operated via a linkage system as the engine packaging just didn't allow room for a shift mechanism in the normal location. Uh, we've got white power shocks and um, we've been told by the owner this morning that Jalera had their own special uh, internals. The water pump body was magnesium and the two aluminium silencers were different lengths and had different diameter expansion cores. The fuel tank and the seat were standard items, unlike the Japanese factory bikes that you've seen me and Max do videos off before. Normally on those factory bikes, money was no object, but I'm guessing with this project, money was. They had to, you know, they had to make sure that the money didn't run away with it. So they used the standard air-cooled seat uh, and tank, but obviously they had to make uh, hand-formed plastics for the radiators. I said the forks look like they're Marazoki, but they're actually not. Having looked at them, they do look very CCM-like of that era. Uh, the rest of the plastics were uh, were, were one-off for the Jalera, Del Auto throttle, top quality Magura levers, and just a very, very exotic bike. Obviously, the bike caused quite the stir when it was unveiled in March 1980. It was a complete game changer. But unfortunately for Jalira, the twin cylinder revolution wasn't permitted to last long. Jalira factory racer and three-time Italian champion Franco Puffini was the man chosen to take the twin cylinder machine to the line for selected rounds of the 1980 125 World Championships. The bicylindrica might have been game-changing, but it was also pretty fragile. So it appears as though Jalira would only pull out their secret weapon when Puffini thought that the power characteristics of the 125B would suit a particular track. The bicylindrica made its race debut in the sands of Holland. The machine was four kilograms heavier than its single cylinder counterpart. And Buffini said it was difficult to ride in the deep stuff because it had less torque than his single cylinder 125. Although he did also say that the 125B was seriously fast on the long straights. Because of these characteristics, Buffini said that the bike was particularly tiring to tame in the deep conditions. This is Puffini's full review from that weekend. The debut of the 125 twin cylinder in the 1980 World Cup was a kind of leap in the dark, because until then we hadn't really tested it. At the bike's debut in Norg, Holland, it was an ordeal to race it in the sandy soil that was full of holes and furrows. The B125 bike had very little torque and the engine had no downward pull. Compared to the single cylinder, it weighed four extra kilos and they all felt like they were loaded on the front wheel. So instead of floating on the sand by raising the front wheel and giving more traction to the rear, I sank into the pits. I couldn't even skip the dips. Franco goes on to say, on the other hand, there was plenty of horsepower and it was very fast on the straights, but it destroyed you. 
In my opinion, the twin cylinder was a one moto bike because it tired you out so much that you couldn't decently make two motos in a GP. I think it would have put in crisis even the most physically fit rider in the world championship, let alone someone like me. After Holland, I asked for less power. When was the last time you heard a 125 racer ask for less power? I think that goes to show just how powerful this 125 bicylindrica really was. So the soft stuff might not have been the natural habitat for the 125B. It was in fact the dry, hard conditions where the bicylindrica really thrived. At the GP in Yugoslavia, the bicylindrica propelled Puffini to the race lead in Moto1. A win was in sight for Puffini and the twin until heartbreakingly the chassis gave out and broke forcing the Jalira man to retire from the race. A fourth place in Germany would end up being the best result for the 125B that season. Seemingly, Jalira had learnt a lot from the 1980 GP campaign, and rumour had it that they were working hard on a new generation machine for the 1981 season that would address the problems that they encountered in 1980, namely the weak frame and the weak crankshafts. They had also acquired the services of a young Italian racer named Michele Rinaldi to represent the brand for the next two seasons. Rinaldi would go on to put Giulia on the championship podium in both 1981 and 1982. However, as preparations for the new bike and the new season began, the FIM decided to drop a bombshell. They had ruled that twin cylinder machines would be banned from world championship competition forevermore. And just like that, the twin cylinder project was abandoned. The 1981 125B would never see the light of day, the Jalira twin cylinders would never go into mass production, and we would never get to see Michele Rinaldi race one on the Grand Prix stage. Although, he probably did ride one locally. For the rest of time, Franco Puffini will be the only rider to have ever raced the 125 by Cylindrica. And we are so lucky to have one of the machines that he raced with us today. So, the Julira 125cc twin cylinder. Why did Julira build it? Well, I think there's a little clue, maybe in the political situation in uh, Italy, during the 70s. Now, if you were a kid or um, a young adult and you were gonna buy yourself a Japanese motocross bike, you had to pay a whopping 38% VAT on top of your bike to, to, to bring that bike officially into Italy. So effectively, your bike was 38% dearer than any homegrown Italian bike. And the reason for this was the Italian government was trying to protect their homegrown motorcycle industry. So there's a little clue on, on why the Italian small CC brands were so, so popular, not just in Italy, but across Europe. So I wanna look at one Grand Prix um, from 1980, the USGP at Mid-Ohio. If anybody remembers that, it was a very, very muddy event, but one particular rider's name came to the forefront that weekend an American rider called Johnny O'Mara, who won that event on a white twin shock water-cooled uh, Mugen Honda. Not a factory Honda, but a Mugen Honda. Uh, but interestingly, second overall at that USGP was Jalira with rider and national, current national champion, Dario Nanini. Now that was a, an epic result for Jalira, and I suspect that was probably their highest overall result at a Grand Prix ever. Now Jalira went to that Grand Prix and they were going to win. They sent 25 staff to that event and they had the choice of none other than three very trick 125 bikes they could have sent. There was, of course, the twin cylinder 125, but they decided that to leave that back in Italy. They also had a single shock water-cooled 125. They didn't take that, but what they did take was their proven twin shock water-cooled 125, which, as I said, finished second overall, which was a huge result. And don't forget, at that Grand Prix, there were some big names. You had the riders like the current uh, 
at the time, current 125cc world champion on Suzuki, Harry Everts. You had uh, up and coming American rider, Golden Boy, Brock Glover on the factory Yamaha. You had Ron Sun, Chuck Sun's brother on a factory 125 Honda. And, and another interesting fact from, um, from that actual Grand Prix is that Jalira was the second lightest bike at that event, which for a small um, company compared to those Itali to those Japanese companies was an incredible result. Jalira knew how to make a great 125cc motocross bike. Although twin cylinder dirt bikes are very rare, Jalira weren't the only guys to give it a go. In the 1970s, a talented Yamaha technician called Ed Scheidler, who was once the mechanic for Pierce Castlemakers and Brock Glover, was tasked with creating a twin cylinder YZ from the ground up. He started with the 1975 YZ125 monoshock frame and the 1974 TA125 twin cylinder air-cooled five-speed road race engine. He created a new cradle to make space for the two exhaust ports and two pipes. And the bike was tested and was said to be very fast, but a new transmission was needed for it to be really effective. And Yamaha just were not interested in the hassle and the costs of developing brand new components for the project. So the twin cylinder YZ was put aside and forgotten about. Elsewhere, Husqvarna had the 1969 twin cylinder Baja Invader 500, and in 1971, we saw the Yankee 500, which was two Osa 250 top ends stitched together. And of course, there was the Aprilia twin four stroke that came way, way later. But other than the Jalira, probably the most famous twin cylinder two stroke to ever exist, or almost exist, was the 1980 Honda RC125 MT. This wild looking machine was in development at exactly the same time as Jalira were racing and developing their own twin cylinder. And I believe this bike was raced in Japan maybe, but much like Jalira, this twin cylinder project was abandoned by Honda when FIM announced their cull on twin cylinder machines. So why did the FIM make this ruling? Why did they stop these major developments from taking place and bearing fruit? That's the mystery that I wanted to try and solve in this video. Was it a money thing? Was it a political thing? Was it a fairness thing? Or was it just because the 125 twin cylinder was simply too fast for the class? It's not really that clear, but I think we might be able to work it out and build up a better idea of what was going on back in the day if we can see the bike in action. The owner of this Jalira, Twin Cylinder 125, is just about to start it up for us, hopefully. So uh, let's see it. Come on.
sing it, incredible. Gran moto. Pensa che avevano spostato l'inclinazione del motore, sì. c'è cioè sul libro, perché per i pesi, no? Per sì, i pesi beh, e sì. anche per l'uscita della potenza. Yeah, we thought we thought the owner was just going to toodle up this lane for us, maybe in first or second gear, but he decided to give it full chat on the way back, and that was just incredible. Like a bike I've never heard. It was more like a road race bike than a motocross bike they've heard. Just a fantastic experience. He was just saying, is it his son? That's his son, yeah. He was just saying that um, he won't be able to sleep for a month now, just that's, smiling. That's the first time since he's owned the bike that he's ever ridden it. So just a, a great moment for us all. Absolutely. And now that was cool to see. The man that owns this bike and the man that we saw take it for a rip just then has never done that before. So we think that he might well be the first guy to turn a wheel on this bike since Franco Puffini himself. I can't reiterate enough how special what we just saw really was. They only made three of these bikes back in the day. One of them currently sits in a museum and is a non-runner. As far as we know, the second one does not survive. So that means that the third one, this one, is the only twin cylinder 125 left in existence. Before we put to bed once and for all just why the FIM cancelled this machine, we first need to say a big thank you, of course, to Dave King, but to the owners of the machine as well for allowing us to make this video and to our Italian fixer, Cruciano, without his help, this video just wouldn't have been possible. If you're ever in Northern Italy in the Turin area, definitely go and spin some laps at Cruciano's indoor go-kart track, the number 45 racetrack there in Turin. It's an awesome time, great fun, and go and check it out if you're in the area. We just couldn't have made this video happen without his help. After doing my research, looking at the results, and actually seeing the bike ride in person, I doubt that the bicylindrica was banned because it was deemed an unfair advantage or too quick for the class. Although with some development, it could have gone that way. It appears to me that the ban was probably more a political thing to save the other manufacturers having to go through the costs and the headaches of producing and developing their own twin cylinder two strokes. I suspect it was it was other brands that were leaning on the FIM to keep the cost down of this class because Honda of course brought out a twin cylinder 125 that was extremely competitive but I suspect they were horrendously expensive to, to build. Yeah, and maintain. And it's, maintain. It's twice the parts, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, twice the problems. Yeah. yeah. There doesn't seem to be a definitive answer that I can find anywhere online. So if you're watching and you are in the know, maybe you were in that FIM office when the decision was made back in the day. If you were, please do drop down in the comments and let us know how and why it really went down. It was an absolute privilege producing this video and I still can't quite believe we were able to make it happen. And I hope that you guys have enjoyed joining us for the ride. As always, my name's Max, you've been watching 999 Laser. Until next time, I'll see you at the track. Yeah, the first step is